Hello and welcome to the Infosys Prize Laureate Interviews. And uh, this year we have Professor Rajan Shankar Narayanan as the Infosys Prize 2020 Life Sciences winner. Thank you, Professor Rajan Shankar Narayanan, for joining us. Professor Shankar, you were awarded the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences for your contributions towards understanding the error-free translation of the genetic code in protein manufacturing in the body. Could you please explain your field of work to us? And what do you see as your legacy or what do you want it to be? Yeah, my field of work is on quality control during translation of the genetic code, or in simple terms, how proteins are made in the cell from the information that is contained in the DNA. Proteins, as you know, are the workhorses of every cell in every living organism. So we have initiated a new line of thinking by bringing to the forefront a forgotten aspect of protein synthesis. That is how nature uses only one form of amino acids for uh, protein making rather than using both the forms that are available to it. So we are already figuring out the importance of processes that does this job in the emergence of microscopic to macroscopic organisms like animals and plants. So this area of ours is expected to flourish in the coming decades as more and more information would become available and it is increasingly becoming clear that the mirror symmetric counterparts of L amino acids, which are D amino acids, are present in the cell. So I consider that this particular aspect of our science where we have brought to the fore is going to be the legacy of ours in this area of research. Professor Shankar, you did your doctoral and postdoctoral research at the Indian Institute of Science, another postdoctoral research with Professor Dino Moraes at IGBMC in France, and for the past 20 years, you have been leading your independent research at the CSIR CCMB. In a research career that has spanned over 30 years, you have worked with the finest minds in some of the world's leading labs. Can you please tell us who or what inspires you? Yeah, so of course, like many people, my early inspiration were my teachers as well as my advisors. Uh, but I would particularly like to mention two individuals who brought me into this scientific world and trained me in terms of how one should be doing research and how to look at a particular problem or my PhD mentor at the Engineering Institute of Science, Professor Vijayan, and my postdoctoral mentor, uh, Professor Dino Moras at Strasbourg, France. You know, they imparted not just by telling you, but by their way or the style of functioning, the importance of discipline and continuous attention to the problem at hand. Uh, currently, of course, I take a lot of inspiration from some of the excellent students that I have in my lab, uh, from their level of enthusiasm, say, die attitude, and also their ability to imbibe larger goals of the team. So the discussions that I have had or I'm continuing to having with these open young minds almost every morning and see them evolve over a period of time, you know, over the years, uh, is the one that inspires me uh, to do whatever I'm doing. It has been nearly three decades in research for you, two specifically in this area of biophysics. Um, you mentioned talking and interacting with your students inspires you. But what really drives you to come back to the same problem day after day? Okay, so you have to have a lot of conviction when you take on the less or rather untraveled road. So when I began working on this very fundamental problem, the major question that I faced from many senior people as well as experts is that why am I working on this area, uh, which you know basically the problem does not even exist. Uh, so that I have to actually work so hard in, in a sense 
against the you know wind uh, or the flow that one should eventually show that such a problem exists because you are convinced and you have enough evidence uh, in the literature which has basically been ignored so that i can with my team can bring it to the forefront and now after nearly 20 years correct that recognition has well come and people know that this is a problem which was ignored for a long time in the biological sciences and therefore uh, we need to bring this particular problem to a larger scientific perspective and to eventually show that how very fundamental processes such as the one that we are looking at which is chirality based checkpoints shaped the evolution of life forms on earth well you've had quite a fascinating career path i must say you did your bsc and msc in physics in fact an msc gold medalist from madurai kamraj university before moving to biophysics if not research i'm curious to know which alternative career would you have considered to be very honest as a student even till masters i never dreamt of Uh, becoming a scientist in fact after bachelor's like many other friends of mine i had applied for jobs like in banking insurance sectors and some technical ones like in bsnl and i also got a couple of these job offers but in the meantime uh, since we were kind of toppers during our masters uh, the professors at our university as well as some of our seniors used to talk quite a bit about indian institute of science and so while doing masters in physics i thought let me at least try out this place and see you know what is going on in this place and in fact that's the only place where i had applied for my uh, phd and it so happened that i got recruited in this interesting area of biophysics uh, after my masters and then as they say uh, that the rest is history so in a sense i am lucky to be in science rather than from day one thinking about i should be a scientist professor shankar academia like many other sectors has been severely affected by the pandemic at a time when the entire approach to education and research is being rethought what would be your message to aspiring researchers okay. so topping the class are being a walking encyclopedia are not essential in today's world uh, in my opinion Uh, google and wikipedia can do that research is a totally different ball game and mostly it has to do with how we look at information and critically analyze them and that information you know as we are you know in in our life that you can get this information from anywhere around us and research is all about keeping an open mind the ability to put loads of work despite lack of any recognition and to take criticism which is the most important thing to do in the correct stride and to top it all uh, to identify the correct research problem uh, to work with in summary i would say it's all about passion uh, to do things correct and what you are interested in and i would rather go on to say that uh, we are actually paid uh, to do our hobby because if you enjoy every day in the lab uh, then the results and laurels will take care of itself Now that's a truly inspiring approach and we believe that your work is a testament to such passion and commitment. Can you please explain uh, the significance of your work to us? Yeah as I said uh, our work involves the process of how accurately proteins are made in the cell. The building blocks of proteins as we all know are amino acids and out of the 20 19 of them are mirror image forms. however only one uh, form called l or left handed can only be used to make proteins you can also use only d to make proteins but nature used in all life forms starting from bacteria to all the way to humans only one form to make proteins so we look at processes that specifically uh, go and pick only the left handed amino acid and removes the right handed amino acids from entering the translational machinery or the protein making machinery since these are one of the very first molecules that could have emerged to make uh, life 
uh, as we see over the past 3.5 to 4 billion years ago, uh, they may have evolved additional functionalities as well. Because when you are present in the system for a very long time, you have the ability to you know, also gain additional functions. This is exactly what our current work is showing that these molecules are also involved in the emergence of what we call as multicellular life forms like us. And really plants, correct, which were basically water-based to move from water to land. Professor Shankar, the jury chair Mirgaon Sur in his congratulatory message remarks, and I quote, the structural portraits that you have generated speak a thousand words and reveal selection mechanisms that are conserved across life. Your work on fundamental problems in molecular recognition has potential applications in drug design through protein engineering. Can you please tell us the practical applications of your discovery? Yeah, so uh, to uh, say the truth, uh, at this point, none. Uh, you know, so we are basically trying to understand, you know, how life forms have come about and how they have evolved. And the most important question from a fundamental point of view here is that errors during any transfer of information from DNA to protein to uh, RNA to protein goes through certain minimal amount of errors. So when I say errors, these errors are absolutely required to keep the evolution going, but the error should be kept at minimum. So this whole process in a biological system is very, very tightly controlled. So that tight control is what we are looking at as to how nature does it. And we are looking at one key process which has helped to keep these errors during protein synthesis to a very minimal level. Like any good quality basic work that will find its application in the due course of time, uh, we can also now think of a couple of them. But when the project began, we were not thinking about, you know, having to apply uh, to any particular application or so on and so forth. So the, the question at this point right now that we can ask is that now that we do have these set of results, can we use them for some other purpose? So the fact that we have reached here, when I look at the problem that we have at hand, we are potentially thinking of certain applications like, say, for example, when nature makes only L-amino acid-based proteins, can we now make only D-amino acid-based proteins in a cell? Now, the system that we are looking at removes the D-amino acids from, uh, you know, proteins-making machinery. If I now make certain changes in my protein, can I now remove L-amino acids from protein-making machinery so that D-amino acids are used? So that means what we are going to possibly create is a mirror image protein world. So, as you know, the L-amino acid protein and the D-amino acid protein, like our left and right hand, would be mirror images of each other. Now, why do we need to make such proteins and what is the practical application? Because when you have a D-amino acid-based protein synthesis machinery and D-amino acid-based proteins in a system, these are very good as antibodies and these enzymes are resist resistant to proteases which are present in our body. So they can be used as antibodies as well as other kind of enzymatic operations that they can possibly do it in a system that will only act on the l amino acid. So these are the kind of things that we are trying to evolve at this point of time. Wow, that is so insightful. If we were to probe this further, would you be able to tell us what inspired you to take up this specific field of research? Yeah, so you may know that uh, I came from a physics background. So we were students uh, who ran away from biology at some point of time because of the way it was taught in our schools those days, uh, just experimenting. I believe things have changed because as I see the younger students coming out, they don't read it as explanatory, you know, and kind of boring as we used to read because at least the textbooks are not as boring. Uh, so I was naturally, you know, those days uh, uh, kind of moving away from biology. That's why I did master's in physics. However, when I moved towards biophysics from a physics-based tool being applied to biology, 
uh, and then started looking at biology in a more fresh manner, I was basically unbiased compared to several others uh, who had a formal training in biology. So in biology textbooks, if you look at it, it has been taught that the proteins are made of L amino acids and that was taken as a gospel by most biologists and the question was not asked as to why the D amino acids that are present in the cell are not used uh, for protein synthesis or how they are kept away from protein synthesis. However, when this classic experiment which is present in almost all biological textbooks, uh, which is called a Urey Miller experiment, in which you had a spark, you know, with mixture of certain raw ingredients that were there in the uh, very early year, you have formation of amino acids in that experiment. And you do have during those early, you know, earth mimicking experiment, both L and D amino acids present more or less at the same concentration in those experiments. So the question that we asked at that time is that if that experiment showed that you have building blocks of L and D amino acids present, how the very first life forms have used only one of those building blocks and never used the other building block. And this question eventually became the inspiration for us to take up this research, particular, uh, research problem. And nearly 20 years back, we initiated this research and we continue to work in the same area. Thank you so much. And uh, I must say that it has a profound impact, especially in the middle of such medical breakthroughs. Now, Professor Shankar, if I were to um, ask you to explain your work and its significance to a 10 year old, how would you explain it? Yeah, that's always a challenge. Uh, let me try it out. So I have this example, uh, which is, you know, like we have all seen cars and uh, many of us may have also seen that how cars are made in a factory, in a car factory. And the car is made of hundreds and hundreds of parts, which are sourced from different places and they come to a particular place where the final car is assembled. So in every cell of our body, where the ingredients are present all over the cell, but the protein making, which is like a car factory, protein making happens at a particular place called the ribosome. The ribosomes are organelles, which you can think of it as a factory for protein making, like a car factory. So when all these small parts which are required for making a car, or in this case proteins, are brought to the factory, you have components which are very similar. Now you have to ensure that the components that reach the car factory are on the correct form. If you have, say, for example, two components which become mirror images of each other, then sometimes there is always a possibility that the components can get mixed up. So instead of putting one component, if you put the other component, which is the mirror image component, then you are going to have a problem in the running of the car or the assembly of the car, and the car can break down. If that process happens, then it's, there's a fault in the car making process. The same way in protein making, if you have these wrong component incorporated in a place where you are supposed to be putting one form of the amino acid, but instead you put the mirror image form, then your protein will actually, what we call technically is unfold, basically losing its shape and eventually the protein dies. And when the proteins die, eventually the cell dies because the function of the proteins are not done effectively in the cell. So what we are trying to understand is that how a particular protein or a process that we are interested in is ensuring that the wrong components are always taken away from the car making factory or the protein making factory, depending on which way that you want to think, and separated out so that only the correct components are eventually used for the protein making. Wow, you've really explained it so well. Um, and um, the way you use that analogy to simplify the complex work. Um, thank you so much again, uh, Professor Shankar Narayanan. And uh, we've come to the end of this interview now. 
and i would love to hear a little bit of reflection from you so um i know that awards um and accolades um they are not something that drives research and scientists um but uh, i just wanted to ask you professor shankar how did winning the ecosys prize impact you you know as uh, we all know uh, science is is a very very tricky and difficult pursuit uh, compared to many other you know professions it takes time to build your capabilities and it takes a lot of effort to eventually initiate your own research work unlike say for example if you look at you know your colleagues who are say in engineering and are in other areas so the recognitions come much later and also after a lot of hard work and therefore it becomes important that people who do really well are recognized uh, particularly in in a context like india and therefore there are very very few of these awards which recognize people with talent at the highest level and that becomes you know not only inspirational to the individual who gets these prizes but also to people around you say for example uh, you know when people like us get this award who are working on areas uh, you know which are very fundamental uh, we don't get to see rewards every other day and therefore to how do you you know impart that kind of enthusiasm to students he is of course by talking lot of science that's what we continue to do but whenever we get this kind of recognition from a well respected body then people come around and you know notice it and that helps us to eventually do way better than you know what we have done so far and also it comes with a lot of responsibility because these are highly prestigious prizes recognized by the best in the world so one needs to take our science to the next level so that's how i see uh, you know as what the infosys prize will do to people like me to not only take it as a recognition but also to see how well that we can take the research that we have done so far to the very next level Thank you so much Professor Shankar. Um I must say it has been a wonderful and inspiring um, session. Thank you.